Good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. At some point this morning, we went rooming in Pentecostal because the time clocks were taken down. So, <laughs> so whether it's a wishful thing or prophetic, all time shall cease. I'll be careful to watch it, don't worry. But we've been talking about what does it mean to become a Pentecostal powerhouse? And we're comparing it to the person who goes to the gym. And they get mean, uh, lean and mean and tough and rough. And when you look at that kind of individual, it does not happen overnight. But it's constantly going to the gym at least five days a week, if not six. It's constantly working out. It's consistency. It's effort. It's work. Maybe eating those things that he wouldn't want to, but he does anyhow, or laying off those sweets and everything else that he doesn't want to, but he does anyhow, because he has a goal. When it comes to us spiritually, the same thing can be true. If we want to become Pentecostal powerhouses, it's not going to be, well, all of a sudden I'm going to fast today, and tomorrow I'm going to wake up with all kinds of spiritual muscles, I'm going to know everything, I'm going to be fluent in this, fluent in that. When the Holy Ghost moves, my spirit's going to be so sensitive, I'm going to know exactly when the Lord speaks, I'm going to know exactly. But rather it takes work on a daily basis. Keeping up our prayer life, keeping up our Bible reading, doing our devotions. And not doing it just to run through it, but doing it with the heart and intent that I may know him and the power of his resurrection in the words of the Apostle Paul. We looked at faith, and what's the enemy of faith? Doubt. Yeah, that is important because faith is in every area of our Christian walk. It's us going to salvation, it is us accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and it is important, especially when we move into our next step here next week when we start begin talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Because every one of those gifts include faith. We've been talking, we talked about the armor and how everything is to get held together by one thing. All the armor is held together by one piece of equipment, and that is the belt. And what is the belt composed of? Truth. Truth is going to lead us into all things. And who is truth? Jesus. Amen. He is the living truth. We've been talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We talked about, is, baptiz is the baptism of the Holy Ghost different from salvation? Is the baptism of the Holy Ghost separate from salvation? Yes. Now I'm going to start pulling a little bit harder. How do we know that it is different? Are the, and when I say how, are there any verses in the Bible, even if you don't know the references, any, can you quote any part of them? Oh, Acts 2 4. Acts 2 4, because the disciples and all them were already saved. They were waiting in the upper room. Mm -hmm. Acts in the 19th chapter. Can you tell me what's going on in Acts 19, brother? That, that was Absolutely. So here we have clear record of men that they were clearly saved. They knew they were saved. And it's not one of those, well, I hope I'm saved, but they were the ones that knew that they knew that they knew that I'm saved. But they never heard of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost is separate from the act of salvation or the gift of salvation. And of course, the evidence that someone has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost is that of speaking in other tongues. We already talked about that a little bit. That is the defining evidence. It's not the stammering lips. When people are speaking for the Holy Ghost, sometimes their lips will stammer. Uh, no, words will really come out, but they'll be kind of like a little bit of mumbling. That is not the baptism. The baptism are words of another language coming out of their mouth. And why is tongues 
the evidence. What's so important about the tongue? It gives you something else that no one else can give you. Uh, so we can say that it's not us controlling our tongue, but the Holy Ghost is controlling our tongue. What does the Bible inform us about our tongue in general? Do you remember what James chapter 3? No man can tame their tongue. How many of us, when we were growing up, our parents told us to do something and we in here? I didn't say that. I didn't mean to say that. It just popped out. Yeah. Did you tell me? No, no, no. It just popped out. Or even if we relate it to the adult world. How many people do we know that um, they say things that they shouldn't and they have no control over it? Whether they hit their um, uh, thumb with a hammer and they curse. Whether there's people that is just part of their everyday vernacular, vernacular, they don't even know that they're saying it maybe somehow in times. It just flows right on out there. Why? Because they have no control of their tongue. Because if it got to the point that the person who uses those curse words all the time would purposely try to stop, they'd have a hard time stopping. Why? Because no man can tame their tongue. It is an unruly evil. And God showed us the importance of that because when we look at Pentecost and we look at Babel, we find exactly what's happening when man controls his tongue versus when God controls his tongue. When man controls his tongue, he gets himself into a lot of trouble. And when everyone speaks the same language, it's easy to get some, hey, well, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. And before you know it, you have a big group of people already murmuring and complaining. And exactly, that's what we have a Bible. God told us to scatter, but we don't want to. It's kind of like they plopped their um, butt right down there in the desert and said, this is where we're going to stay. You're not budging us. And God came down and confused their language. And when we look at that, there is a difference because God controlled their language and said, okay, that's enough. But at Pentecost, God came down and said, it's not your language you're going to have. But it's going to be my language. I'm going to control that tongue. And we all go back to, I think it's the part, where he said that they shall speak with new tongues. Why? Because it's not us. It's all of him. I'm trying to figure out where I want to go, so just bear with me a little bit. Well, let's start here. So receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost in history, we're going to start talking there. I don't know if you have those notes or not. But regardless, when we look at Pentecost, Pentecost has been around for a very long time. Thousands and thousands of years. And it might just stop about there because we're going back to just after um, ADs. Probably right around in 33 AD. And what happens around that time? We have a group of 120 people who were obedient. Obedience is key. They were told to go and tarry in Jerusalem. God didn't tell them to go anywhere else. He didn't tell them to stop off at the marketplace and buy this. Don't go visit so-and-so. But he said, go and tarry in Jerusalem. And that's where we see the first time that the Holy Ghost comes down and fills men. He shall was with you, but he shall be in you. And it's at Pentecost, in that Pentecostal chapter, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, for the first time, we see the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence in other tongues. And from there it continues on. Other, Jew, other Jews get baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire with evidence of speaking in other tongues. And it becomes so common that more than likely that's the reason we don't see any more uh, writings of that little tag along in the New Testament when they say that they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they leave off with evidence in other tongues is because it was common. They knew it. There was no need to document it. It would have been redundant. They know how they got it. And then, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 11, if I remember correctly, we see Peter going to <coughs> a Gentile's house because the Holy Ghost sends him there. 
and he comes back and reports to Jerusalem. You're not going to believe this, but now the Gentiles have a baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other, in other tongues. They got it just like we got it. And as we go throughout the New Testament, we see that other people got the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. And that's where it all began. And if we would look at the early church, we would find that that baptism of the Holy Ghost continued on. And that the early church spoke in tongues. Would someone please read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 18, please? 1 Corinthians 14, 18. And someone else find Acts 11 and 15. Acts 11 and 15, because I'm not sure if this is in there or not. I think my God speaks with tongues more than you all. Who's speaking here? Oh. Wrong brother, he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the Apostle Paul. <laughs> the Apostle Paul. And he wrote it in English. No, uh, but anyhow. The Apostle Paul spoke that he... Um, said that he spoke in tongues more than a wall. So we see that the Apostle Paul had the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We were talking about Cornelius' household. Acts 11 and verse 15. If someone would please read that. And as, I, excuse me, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And as on us in the beginning. It fell on them as on us at the beginning. Did... Uh, the writer of Acts, which would be Luke, uh, record the words of Peter that he said, well, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and with other tongues. No. He said, they got it just like we did. He didn't need to. They knew what they were talking about. Just like we did. When we leave um, the Bible, because we know the book of Acts is a continuation of the history of the church, we find that around 180, Eus um, Eusebius, one of the church historians, said this, Writing to the preaching evangelists who were never yet living, who were yet preaching evangelists who were yet living, Eusebius says, of those that flourished in these times, um, Cotras is said to have been distinguished for his prophetical gifts. There are many others also noted in these times who held rank in the apostolic succession. The Holy Spirit also wrought many wonders as yet through them, so that the gospel was heard. Many in crowds voluntarily and eagerly embrace the true faith where, with their whole minds. So they're being used in prophetical gifts. Guess what? These men would have, been, would have had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In AD 115-202, Irenaeus wrote. Now he was a pupil of Polycarp. Who was a, and Polycarp was one of the martyrs of the early church. You can find that in Fox's Book of Martyrs. But he, Poly, um, Irenaeus, who was his, Polycarp's pupil, and, um, and Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John, so we have a direct connection with the early church, he wrote in his book against heresies, book 5, In like manner do we also hear many brethren in the church who possess prophetic gifts, who through the Spirit speak all kinds of languages, and bring to light, for the general benefit that hidden things of men and declare the mysteries of God, who is also the apostles' term spiritually. So here at 115 to 202 AD, we have Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, direct connection with the early church. They still spoke in other tongues. So they still had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Around AD 300, the early martyr, martyrs, they enjoyed these gifts. Dean Farah, Farah, in his book, Darkness to Dawn, states, even for the menace allusions and particulars, I have contemporary authority. He refers to the persecuted Christians in Rome singing and speaking in unknown tongues. What are these unknown tongues? Evidence that these early martyrs had the baptism of the Holy Ghost with speaking in other tongues. Moving on, A.D. 390, Chrysodom of Constantinople. He was bishop of Constantinople, and he wrote this. Whoever was baptized in apostolic days, he straightway spoke with tongues, for since of their coming from, over from idols, 
without any clear knowledge or training in the scriptures, they at once receive the Spirit. Not that they saw the Spirit, for he is invisible, but God's grace bestowed some sensible proof of his language, another in the Roman, another in the, in the Indian, and in another in some other tongues. And this made manifest to them that were without that, without that it was the Spirit in the very person speaking. Wherefore, the apostle calls it the manifestation of the Spirit, which is given to every man to profit with all. So now we're going to go on to 400 AD from Augustine of Hippo. He was the bishop of Hippo, <coughs> one of the four great fathers of the Latin church, and considered the greatest of them. And he said this, we still do what the apostles did when they laid hands on the on Samaritans and called down the Holy Spirit on them in the laying of tongues, it is expected that the converts should speak with new tongues. So 400 <coughs> years after Christ, or if you want to put a conservative estimate on it, 360 years after Christ, they are still receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in unknown tongues. While you will not probably find that wording, there is evidence that Charles Wesley will state that while walking down a path, that sometimes his brother John would break out into an unknown language. So even in the 1700s, I believe Wesley's were 1700s, we still see that the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of tongues is still around. Did it hinder off and die off a little bit? Possibly, because it's not really known throughout church history, but we do see that it has never gone away. Because we will see spots in history where people get so desperate for a move of God that they literally cut holes in their ceilings and release doves, simulating the presence, hoping that the Spirit of God would come down. Pentecost in America, as we know of it, and I stress as we know of it, did not really come around to about 1901. In 1901, in Topeka, Kansas, at Bethel Bible School, there were a group of students that came across a passage of Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And they didn't understand it. And they wanted to know, what is the baptism of the Holy Ghost? What is it? And is it for us? So they began praying that God would reveal it to them. The very first student to get baptized with the baptism of the Holy Ghost was at, um, Agnes Osmond. And this occurred, and let me go to my notes so I don't butcher it up. One of the students, Agnes M. Osmond, asked that hands might be laid upon her to receive the Holy Spirit since she desired to go to foreign lands as a missionary, according to Parham. Parham um, was one of the teachers there. After midnight on January 1st, 1901, Parham laid his hands, laid his hands upon her and it stated in this manner, I have scarcely repeated three dozen sentences when the glory fell upon her, a halo seemed to surround her head and face, and she began to speak, she began speaking in the Chinese language, and was unable to speak English for three days. When she tried to write in English to tell us of her experience, she wrote the Chinese. Copies of which we have we still have in newspapers printed at that time. Parham actually ended up leaving. To beat Kansas at one point, and traveling, I believe it was to Texas, and it was there that he ran into a man by the name of William Seymour. Somehow they got connected, and when we get into William Seymour, of course he is the one known with the Azusa Street Revival. He was the pastor at the mission church out there. And really between Topeka, Kansas, and Azusa Street. That's where we have modern-day Pentecost as we know of it. But speaking in other tongues, as we can see, has never ceased. It was always out there to some degree, just like the truth of God's Word. If we look at the church world today, and people throughout history ahead of us were to look back, 
what would they say about the church world today as a whole? They did not really preach the word of God. They did not have the tr full of truth. We had all the ministers appear to seem to preach a false gospel, one that uh, lightened the hearts of the people, but also heavied their pockets. But that, does that change the fact that there are those small pockets out there that really have the truth? The baptism of the Holy Ghost might have dwindled down upon how many people actually received it throughout the years and the centuries, but it never ceased to exist. Just like it will never cease to exist until that point in time when we can take in context that verse that says, tongues shall cease. Until Christ comes again and establishes his kingdom on this earth, tongues are not going to cease. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is out there because it is a free gift for everyone that believes. And it, if we look at history, even continue on from there at Azusa Street, tongues never ceased. Smith Wigglesworth is one of the most prominent people used in the gifts of the Spirit in the 1900s. And he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost after a woman named Mrs. Brody laid her hands on him and prayed for him that he should receive it. In 1907, in Sunderland, England, after telling her that he was heading home without the tongues because he went there seeking it, seeking the baptism, she said it's not tongues that you need, it's the baptism. She then laid his, her hands on him and prayed for him. And then Smith Wigglesworth received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is for everyone that believes. And regardless of what any sect of Christianity or any religion states today, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is real and is still for those who believe today. It has not ceased. It has not dwindled down or gone completely away and vanished. But the tongue is for everyone that believes. And believing is the requirement. You cannot get the baptism of the Holy Ghost without salvation. There are those that claim that the tongues have ceased, that they have gone away. And they like to use the verse, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8. If someone would please read that. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. So tongues shall cease. <coughs> when we take this verse in context and we step back, what is this whole chapter focusing on as a whole? When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what is this whole uh, chapter dealing with to begin with? Charity, love, whatever you want to refer to it as. So it's not focusing on tongues. It's not focusing on sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. It's talking about love. It's describing love. And it does say that tongues shall cease, but it's talking about a future time as well. It's not talking about here and now. It's talking about a time when God shall establish his kingdom and there'll be no more need for tongues. Because it tells us when tongues will cease, but when tongues will cease. And we find that in verse 10. If someone would please read verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 13. So scripture interprets scripture. When shall tongues cease? When that which is perfect is come. What's that? That is Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ here physically right now? And when I say physically, I'm talking about established his kingdom, sat on the throne of David, he's here ruling with a rod of iron. No, he's not here yet. So tongues have not ceased. The Baptists take this out of context. So when we are looking at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, 
It's still for today. How do we know that? Because tongues have not been gone away with. And it's for everyone that believes. And when we got, we've just taken a trip through history. And we've looked and saw that the baptism of the Holy Ghost has not ceased throughout history. So why did it cease all of a sudden? Right now, right here. It never did. Because Jesus Christ has not come back yet. So what is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? We find the purpose in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other. <coughs> so in that very first phrase right there, we have the purpose of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And what does it say? But ye shall receive power. Power. It is to empower the believer. Empower the believer to do what? To be what? Well, it is to empower the believer to be witnesses. If we go there, we see ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea and on all Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Sometimes we don't always know what to say to somebody. We can try and tell somebody, you know what? You need Jesus. So, the Holy Spirit. What, what bring that upon the person? The baptism of all the Holy Ghost? So if you're baptized, you're saying you receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. no. What brings it on to somebody that makes you speak in tongues? You need to be... Worshiping, worshiping Christ? Worshiping Christ. Uh, looking for it. Because it's a free gift. All you have to do is receive it. But I still go back to you have to be saved first. Once right. you are saved, then you need to be seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you're saying you're baptized, so you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you're baptized. Is that what you're saying? Uh, there's a difference between the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptism in water. Baptism in water and baptism of the Holy Ghost are two separate things. All the baptism in water does is physically, it is a physical outward sign, symbolic, that your old nature, your old sin nature is done away with and you are a new creature in Christ. That's water baptism. You change your ways. And you change your, it's an outward sign. It's an outward showing. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is when the glory of God comes on you and fills you. And the evidence of that is the speaking in other tongues. So when you're filled, you automatically speak out, burst out in different tongues. Different languages. When you are filled, yes, because the glory can be so heavily upon you that you're not speaking another language yet. You just have stammering lips, but he's not filled you at that point yet. When words are coming out, then you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Or did that lead to a whole other group of questions? No, it makes sense. So water baptism is completely different than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and He fills you. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it takes a little bit until the person... Because the big aspect of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is surrender. How many of us find surrendering to God easy? It's not always easy. Uh, and sometimes there are things in our life that we're not aware of that are keep, is keeping us from receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. However, if we are truly seeking, the Holy Ghost will bring those things to life. And he will inform you that, hey, you need to get this right before you do this, before I feel you. Or you need to change this. Or you need to make this right with so-and-so, whatever the case well, is. Well, then you're not repenting everything. 
You're repenting. You repent, you repent all your sins, you repent of everything. Yeah, but not everything that you refuse to surrender to God is sin. Sometimes there's just some things you just don't want to give up. God wants our full surrender in every area of our life. He wants to have full control of our life. And sometimes it's just a matter of saying, God, I, don't, I want to have control of this little area. It's not sin, but I want to have control of it. Whether it's you picking a career and not letting God guide you into what he wants you to do. Whether it's uh, God telling you to maybe do, to go talk to your neighbor and tell them about me. So you're talking, talking about, like, for instance, you're talking about like uh, an alcoholic. Nope. So they go to church and they go out and keep drinking. And that's something you're not uh, giving up for Christ. Nope, I'm not talking about that at all. So it doesn't have to be sin. It don't have to. It doesn't have to be sin. God, well, why, would, why would he want you to change something if it is not sin? Because sometimes God wants to see more fully surrendered to him. It could be a matter of me working for Brother Dennis, but I feel God tell me that, hey, I'm going to go work over here for Brother Peter Mitch. But because I'm saying, God, no, I'm making more money with Brother Dennis, and I like the fellowship that I have there. And Sister Sandy feeds me well and <laughs> keeps me in snacks. It's like, I'm not going over there. And because of that, that's preventing me from getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost because not every area of my life is completely well, surrendered. I've heard no. that already. People go work at a sinful place because of money. They put money first. You follow me? Yeah, I, I follow you. I a lot follow of people you. get an offer a job for say a hundred thousand, and somebody else offered them fifty thousand. But it's a worse place to work at, a more sinful place to work at. Most people would take that hundred thousand dollar job than working for somebody that's in a Christian environment. But some things aren't always sin. Not if you go out first, that's sin. I'm not saying that. If it's plain sin, you, you know better. You got what you're saying here. You got to you got to hit me in the head or something. But I don't understand that. God wants Why would God come after you if you're not sinning? Because God wants to make sure that you are fully surrendered to him. That if he tells you to do something in the future, that he knows you're going to listen to him. Why should he give you the baptism you're being of the Holy Ghost? fully obedient. Yes. Why should God give you the baptism of the Holy Ghost if you cannot, <coughs> if he cannot trust you to do what he asks you to do now? When it comes to the gift, it is a trust issue with God. Why should he give you more gifts if he can't trust you with what he's already given you? Yes, he gives to every man separately as he wills. Okay, how come some people, there you go, how come some people you see are real wealthy and live a little real sinful life, and the next person that's Christian is struggling to make a living? Because some things are different for different people. Sometimes it's just the way that things happen. I mean, some things are God, some things are just the way it is. Why do we get sick? Because of Adam and Eve, what they did. You know, well, some, that's, why that's, do they get well, rich? Maybe the parents had a great business. So that's why all well, bad things happen to the flesh. Why does the flesh is sin? Not all things are even just because it's God the name. It's because the choices that we make. God makes us free will. So sometimes we need to make choices that are not the way that we want to be. Yeah, that's true. 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 Yeah, Symbolism that you've died with Christ and you're resurrected in the newness of life. 
it is important to show that. It's important for us. It's important for us to make that public stand that we died for Christ. But it has nothing to do with being filled with the Holy Ghost. Does that help you too? Yeah, what I'm getting at, you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you've got to be more hungry and get into the Word and pray more and worship the Lord more. Which is what I'm getting out of what you're saying. Worship is very So you're just going to sit there and go through going to church and sitting and not studying the Bible, then don't expect to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Is that, is that correct? Right. That's right. They went to the upper room, they tarried. The word tarry doesn't leave us with a oh, they were going to church social and sitting there and all of a sudden, bam, the Holy Ghost comes. They went and they prayed, they sought, they waited for the Holy Ghost. Instead, we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high, but there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, Lord, I pray that you go to the song leader and the musicians, give them a special blessing as they praise upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Knowing the song leaders as they lead us the songs you have us to sing, knowing the pastors, my name is looked as it brings forth your message, Lord, we'll give them a special blessing as well. Let our hearts and minds be plowed that you can soil for your word to follow and that we may remember throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we may apply to our lives and be even more transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Crystal caught my phone.
Yes. 
to another day. Yeah. Oh, we're glad to see you. Bye. Praise the Lord.